Um, this is a bit a different way for me to present because typically I do scientific presentations and I deliberately chose not to try to show too much scientific stuff or not at all. And I took a completely different approach. I'm going to try to give you some insights into what radiotherapy is through images from art. So you will see a few pictures of radiotherapy, but all the rest is pictures of art. So bear with me. I'm, I'm not sure if this is going to work, but um, let's see. So my name is Yolanda Lievens, by the way. I'm a radiation oncologist, so I'm a clinician. I'm a doctor. Uh, and indeed, I'm the colleague of Friedrich. We work very closely together. And I chose to call this the art in radiotherapy because, well, and now I have to see where I, oh yeah, the point of maybe the so, I first want to start by showing you a little bit what radiotherapy is, how it works, a little bit, what it means. And this is uh, what I called radiotherapy in context. And Frédéric will understand why I chose Roger Ravel as the leading artist through this, ex through this presentation. Uh, but uh, I can tell you later on. Anyway, so... Actually, what I first want to explain to you is, is the care part of radiotherapy, because you've seen pictures, you've seen pictures of the machine, but we can't just put a patient on the machine. We have to do several steps before we get there, and these steps are in big part also related to the work that uh, Frederick and his colleagues are doing, obviously. So we start with treatment preparation. So we start with actually imaging the patient. It is typically a CT scan, a simple normal CT scan. But we use these pictures to include them in a, in a planning system. So this is a computer system that already comes very close to, to the heart of Frederick. So we put these pictures where the patient is well imaged in treatment position in a computer system. And, and in our department, there's a CT scan, but on top of that, you can use other pictures, a PET scan, an MR scan, to fuse together with the images from the CT. And on the basis of that CT scan, and that's the second picture, we, as doctors, do a delineation. This is a very simple example, but we do delineate where the tumor is, where the lymph nodes are we want to irradiate, so we define the target of the irradiation. Huh? And actually, what I forgot to say is that actually during the imaging, also the isocenter of the irradiation is being defined. So that refers, obviously, to the title of this presentation. And along with defining where we want to have the irradiation being focused, others, and that's colleagues again of Frederick, our planners, or those images, they define everything which is around the tumor in the patient in terms of normal tissues. That means, for example, if you look at the lung, the heart, the spinal cord, the lungs, we delineate all this because we need this information in order to tailor the treatment individually to the patient. That is actually what is done during the planning exercise. Uh, we try to find how to irradiate. You've seen pictures of arcs uh, of, of uh, continuously, well, the machine turning continuously, well, continuously arc and going back around the patient, but we also have other ways of approaching the patient with fixed beams. And then, before we start the treatment, there's a treatment dosimetry. You've seen a picture of a head, which was actually a phantom that was pictured, but this is also work of the physicist of checking if everything that which has been planned is indeed also qualitatively correct. And then we go to the next step, to the daily treatment. And actually, this is something that we do on a daily basis. And Frederick already mentioned that radiotherapy is typically a stepwise process with daily treatment sessions, which can go from a few sessions up till six, seven weeks of treatment. And so what we do, we first again do an imaging on the treatment coach where we check if everything that we've defined upfront during preparation is correct. Then we 
corrects if needed with the positioning of the patient. Then we start the treatment. And in some cases, per treatment dosimetry is done. And this is done every day again during the whole treatment of the patient. And actually, if, if we see during this imaging, during treatment, that, that something changes, that the tumor shrinks a lot, that the anatomy of the patient changes, then we start the whole preparatory cycle again. And that is what we call adaptive radiotherapy. And, and that we call, well, in our terms, we call it art. It has nothing to do with art, but uh, that's adaptive radiotherapy. So this is more or less the only thing that I'm going to show you of pictures of radiotherapy. So from now on, you will have to use your imagination because what the aim is of this irradiation of this radiotherapy treatment is that we optimize the treatment that we really try to maximize the tumor control, that we give the optimal dose to the tumor, and we give as little as possible to everything which is around it. Uh, I, t I told you the, the heart, the lungs, the spinal cord, the esophagus in, in, in terms of, of, of uh, lung cancer, these are very important organs. We try to minimize the dose to the normal tissues because we want to give the best treatment to each individual patient. And this is a representation a bit pictorial on how radiotherapy over the last decades has been evolving when, well, I, I almost didn't use that <laughs> anymore, I'm not that old yet, but uh, the field, for field box technique was actually a very simple approach of if you had a tumor somewhere in the middle of the body, you would use two beams from one side and two beams from the other side, and in the center of the body you would have a kind of a box being irradiated, that is, focus on the isocenter of the tumor. But that was even before we had CT scans, so that was a really very manual approach, knowing the anatomy of the patient, positioning the patient based on pure x-rays. And then slowly one started to use 2D plans where we started to cut out part of these beams in order to shape already a little bit the volume to be irradiated towards what the tumor is. And well, actually, I, I think I <laughs> I'm more or less started with the, the transition between 3D conformal radiotherapy and IMRT. So 3D conformal radiotherapy is actually when we use CT scans. And what I explained to you, where we draw the, the, the tumor and we draw all the organs at risk, that is what we call 3D conformal radiotherapy. And that moved towards IMRT, which is intensity modulated radiotherapy, where we really shape the beam within the beam to more optimally conform, again, the volume of the patient, to, or no, the volume of the irradiation to the volume of the tumor. So this is actually what you've seen. All the pictures that you've seen are pictures of IMT treatments. And for that, and you've seen some pictures also, what you see on the left bottom is um, a multi-leaf collimator. Actually, when I spoke about blocks or shaping the beams in the 2D plan, this was all very manually. Now this all goes automatically. This all goes driven by electronics and by computers. Uh, we can only do this because we have stronger computers, better machines, and better imaging. That's why we can do what we can do. And then you get this type of treatment where you use different angles and you shape the beam towards the tumor and you avoid everything which is around it. And even a further step is where you give different doses within the tumor, and this is called dose painting. This is very much still research driven, but where you try to give a higher dose within the volume of the treatment, where you have based on images the um, indication that the tumor might be more resistant and where you pump up the dose. But this is very much um, research driven. So this is a bit the evolution over the last, uh, yes, let's say uh, five, six decades, uh, starting from front field to what we are doing now. And then everybody always thinks that we use very fancy machines, and I deliberately didn't make any pictures of machines, uh, but we use fancy machines, that's true. We, we use complex machines, you've seen pictures of it uh, in the exhibition. And that is really because, well, we need this technology in order to really use a cutting or obtain a cutting edge uh, precision. We really want to focus the treatment where it has to be and avoid as much as possible all the rest. Mm. So that is why we need very uh, complex machines. But I'm always a bit frustrated if people think, well, radiotherapy is purely machines because it's obviously not. Huh? We can't do 
things with the machines if there's not a good team of people around it. And I'm a radiation oncologist and I would say that each treatment is really individualized to the patient. And, and if I chose for radiotherapy, it's really this interaction between a very technological discipline with a lot of images and, and know-how in that perspective, but with a very important interaction with the patient. Because each patient who comes with us to us has a very important problem. They all have cancer. They are faced with a life-threatening disease. So you're really, and, and Frederick also already alluded to that, that as a physicist you're a bit further away, but we should never forget that everything we do is dealing with the patient who is in a very difficult position. So it's an individualist and very compassionate care, I would say. And we cannot do this alone. Eh? The whole trajectory that I've shown you in the first, one of the first uh, slides is really a very strong interdisciplinary process. You cannot do it alone as a doctor. You cannot do it alone as a physicist. You have nurses. We call it RTTs, radiation therapists. We've got dosimetrists. We, of course, have all the supporting personnel, like secretaries and so on. But you need this chain to be able to give the optimal treatment. If even one part of the chain is not functioning well, the whole chain won't work. So it's a very strong interdisciplinary process. But on top of that, it's also a very important multidisciplinary process, and more so from the po point of view of the doctor, because radiotherapy is one part of the oncological treatment. Uh, typically, a cancer patient will have chemo or um, now targeted or immunotherapy together with radiotherapy or there will be surgery before or after. So typically we will have a multidisciplinary approach to the patient. So as a radiation oncologist, you're part of this multidisciplinary uh, interaction. And then we come to the role of the medical physicist, of course. I of course, I have to say I won't spend too much time to that, Frederick. But of course, the medical physicist is, is core into what we do. If we if we don't have good medical physicists, we can't deliver these treatments. And actually, what we want to do is to deliver a very accurate and precise treatment. This would be a precise focusing, but not on the isocenter. So that's okay, but that's not that's not good. That's all around the isocenter, that's good, but it's not precise. So what you really want to have is that the beam is really focused there where it, where it has to be and that you uh, avoid as much as possible all the rest. It always boils down to the same. And there you have now a picture uh, or a drawing of a linear accelerator. You've seen pictures of it. And I'm not going to detail what all this of this machine is. Um, but what you see is that it all boils down to this isocenter to which also the, the name of this exhibition is, is focused. Huh? Um, because all the pieces of the machine have to be very well calibrated, they have to be checked, they have to be quality assured. Because if that's not done, you can think you deliver a certain dose of radiotherapy at a certain spot, but it won't be the case. Huh? So if we think the machine delivers a gray at a certain point, this should be the case. And this is part of the, well, this is one part of the work of the physicist, uh, giving the quality assurance of the machines, making sure that the machine does what it should do. On the other end of the spectrum, there's the quality assurance of the treatment. So each individual treatment goes through the hands of the physicists, its quality is short. So there's the, the chain of work that is quality assured by the physicist, but there's also each individual treatment of each individual patient that is uh, quality assured by the physicist. And here you see an example of a very focused treatment on a lung tumor. Um, I don't know if you can recognize what it is, but uh, the big thing at the right upper side is, is the heart. You've got part of the vertebra, you've got the rib cage, and you have the lung in between, and you see a dot in the middle, that's a lung tumor, and you see a very focused treatment, what we call a stereotactic body radiotherapy uh, treatment on a lung tumor. So this is an example of what our treatments would look like. So, but how do we go from radiotherapy to a new term that I've learned, I didn't know it, eh? generative art. I have to look at it every time, generative art. So, um, actually when Frederick told me that he was invited to have this exhibition, we had a bit of a brainstorm moment, um, thinking, well, what could it be? Well, he 
he had much more, but I remember that we had one brainstorm moment. Eh? We have been sitting together and discussing. And um, I think the first idea was a bit, well, can't we use artistic um, examples to translate into this generative art? And we are both very fond of Anne-Theresa de Kiersmaker. And, and you probably know her uh, from Rosas. And what is so nice about the choreographies that she makes is that they are, well, they look very poetic, but they are extremely structured. Huh? If you see in her books how she details the choreography, this is one of these pictures of uh, choreography that is called Face. And you really see the steps that she, because that was, I think, even the first that she ever danced alone, uh, the, the steps that she makes, and then it builds up to a structure, which is a bit actually like building up the pictures that Friedrich has been making now. Eh? And here you see her dancing. The, so this is a square with, um, with, with, with sand. And she's dancing on this, and gradually you have the picture that is arising. So I, I thought this was really nice because for me it's a bit of a, a kind of yeah, parallel to what Friedrich has been doing. Um, but okay, we didn't work with Andres at Kiersmaker, but if you still look for a good idea, we are still very open to that. Huh? So uh, Friedrich, we wouldn't say no. I wouldn't say no. Anyway, the other thing that we had been brainstorming is, well, maybe we should translate something in nature into something that is digital. Huh? And I'm not sure if any of you have ever seen this picture, but it's fascinating. You should look it up at YouTube. You can find it on BBC Earth. So I don't know if any one of you knows what it is. Is it a big castle? Is it you know what it is? Yeah, okay. You know, don't spoil it. Um, I think it's pretty, it's not very small. It's not very big. It's under the water. You can see it from the color. And actually, it's a um, structure. It's an, an, um, an, uh, a piece of art that is made by a little fish a puffer fish uh, in the region of Japan. And he makes this to attract women, oh, little women fishes. Huh? So I find this so extremely cute. You can see the fish there, busy with his work. Apparently it takes a week to make this very nice um, structure. And he has to be quick and do it correctly because if it takes too much time, then the water will wash it away. So it's, <laughs> I find this extremely poetic and that's a little cute boy that makes this. Uh, so if a man would make that for me, uh, I think I'm lost. <laughs> anyway, but so we, we didn't work with nature pictures. Um, you know what it was. Huh? So I think what Frederick has been doing is unlocking the art of radiotherapy and uh, this is one of the pictures that I stole from what he sent me uh, through WhatsApp at some point. Um, so, and um, I want to end with this one, which is again a picture of a work of Roger Ravel. And um, he made a little carriage. This is a carriage, and what you don't see is that the top is actually a mirror. So what it was, it was a little carriage that you could walk around with, and by walking you could see the sky. Huh? And I actually, I think that's, that's a bit of a, a picture also of what I see with, with the work of Friedrich, but very much, uh, well, often with art, of course, huh, that you capture the reality, but you don't see the real reality. You see an image, well, um, the... the yeah, Philip said it's it's not an it's not an image, it's an image of the reality. Well what Frederick has been doing with art is very often that and, and this is also a very poetic way of capturing the reality while you're walking with a little carriage and you see the sky looking into the so capturing the reality through art, I think that's something that we all like and that Frederick has been doing very nicely. And he will now explain again and more in detail how this work has been done. Frederick, I think the floor is yours. I was actually a bit hesitant about what to talk because this is actually the first time that I really do a presentation about my work. I have done presentations about for you about other people's work. I have done presentations about the principles of generative art, about mathematics, mathematics geometry, uh, some ideas I had, but I have never ever presented personal work uh, like this. And I think what is unfortunately necessary to position it is, is to talk about me, which is even worse than talk about my work. But 
I have a background as a, a physicist. I said it in the exhibition. So I've been in medical physics for 20 years, working in a hospital as, as, as a clinical medical physicist, not that much involved in, in uh, real scientific research. But before that, I was a solid-state physicist. And as a solid-state physicist, I was an experimental physicist. That meant that my job in the lab was to build things, to invent experiments, to find ways to do measurements and find ways to analyze those measurements. I was in a field which we would now call nanotechnology, the properties of small um, metal particles. And in fact, the lab I worked was more or less a pipeline for the now omnipresent research institute of IMEC. But I did not really follow that traditional path. And it, it is an exi exciting thing to do, that kind of research, but it's also a kind of research where you don't have a handbook or, or a guideline. So you are trying to investigate a, a type of uh, small metallic particle that doesn't exist, you cannot buy it, so you have to build a machine that makes them, you have to build a machine that studies them, you have to find ways of doing it, you have to write the software, you have to analyze them, and of course, whenever you do this, you're bound to encounter all kinds of problems, small problems to big problems. And what we've been, in that year that that research took, we've been taught is, is to use so-called toy models. And toy models are what we use are a bit like back of the envelope calculations. You are not trying to capture the entire complexity of a system because that's impossible, but you're trying to capture the essential and see if what you are using as a common sense or, or if your ideas that you have at least in order of magnitude make sense. And what I discovered primarily during those re years of research is that I like very much to create toy models. So these are images from, from my uh, dissertation. Uh, we had a, a microscopic group, so these, these images you see are nanometers in scale. So these are very, very tiny structures. And actually we had no idea whether this was something that we expected or not, or why it would be. So a part of my work was is to make a toy model and see if we have any ideas, if, if they would reproduce this, and that works very well. I left that field and I started uh, in medical physics for several reasons. But I never stopped making the toy models. And in fact, it, it's now been more than 20 years, and uh, at the time I didn't know that this had a name. And, and this kind of trying to produce images, structures, uh, not directly, but by creating systems that create, that this had a name, and that this is generative art. And what fascinated and what has always fascinated me in generative art is that it's actually a very contemporary art. It's an art that deals with processes, with how things evolve and how sometimes simple rules lead to behavior that is far more complex or unexpected or unwanted than what the people putting the, the rules in place actually wanted. And, and it's a very universal thing because it's something we see in economy. It's something we see in democracy, for example. It's not limited to numbers or data. I mean, we have a system where we want to have good leadership and where we have a model that tells us that if we... We cannot all talk at the same time, so we need represent representation. So what better way to choose representation by voting? But a little insidious parasitic system in this evolves that actually you are not electing people who are per se, by necessity, good leaders. You are electing people who are good at getting votes. This is not malign this is not something malignity, this is not by design, but it's something intrinsic to the systems. And I think generative art is really the art form that investigates these kinds of systems. A part of, of the interest, of course, in any kind of generation of art is, is aesthetics. And, and I very much like how with very, very simple rules, you can get unexpected results. And that's also why I've been investigating this. Uh, and during these many years of doing this, I've contacted or I've been contacted or we've started working together. And we had order of operations, this beautiful exhibition which I had the chance to participate, which explored this idea of, of creating complexity from simple things. 
which was still a very mathematical, very geometrical, uh, very clean concept. A concept, I think, which is quite common in, in arts and sciences. And the, the, the subject itself is, is quite... Uh, cold is not the right word, but it's scientific. There's, there's a human factor in it, but it's, it's not coming to the foreground. And when we had discussions about... Uh, when Om asked me how would we proceed, the idea was... Yeah, I'm working in medicine for 20 years, and this has been a huge evolution for me personally, going from a, a solid-state physicist where everything is a particle, everything is a machine, to something which really, really uh, involves people at a very fundamental thing. And also to work inter- and multidisciplinary is also something which is a new experience for somebody who is coming out of a traditional physics lab. So for me, this was really enriching and it's really ch shaped who I am, I guess. And so how do we come to this? How we came to the idea of trying to find the human element in a very technical part of, um, of radiotherapy? Now, thankfully, Yolanda has, has beautifully explained the, the entire process, and, and what you have is, is you have the very initial thing. If I were to be a patient radiotherapy, the way I would experience this is I would have a lot of doctors I would have to talk to. There would be a lot of tests, a lot of results, a lot of discussions. Then I would be finally see a something, a radio a radiation oncologist, a term I probably never heard about. I, I, so I, I've experienced it in my family, how difficult it is for, for patients themselves to orient themselves in this entire process, to, to know what exactly is going on, who are all these people I'm, uh, I'm involved with. And then there's, there's like a pause. You get the message, okay, we will start with your treatment in a week or in two weeks, we will start with the treatment. And then as a patient, I come back to the department and they, they lead me to this other place, another wa waiting room. And I have to go into this bunker and, and being positioned by nurses who obviously really care about, uh, about me, but who will leave the room at a certain... And they say, okay, we have cameras and if there's something, just wave or shout, we will hear you, we will see you. But still, at that time, and that, that's, that's, a, a real, that's a realization, you are alone in that bunker. What I am working with is everything that comes in between. The part of the process where the patient and them themselves are not present. And in fact, as a medical physici physicist, I do not have actual patient contact and act the patient possibly isn't aware that there is something like that going on. Um, because at that moment, we have our patients, they had the discussions, the medical history, the diagnosis, the discussions between the, the different disciplines and medicine itself, because radiotherapy itself is a part of a much broader approach to treat cancer. And what we have is all this data. We have this imaging data. What we actually have at that time, and, and the term is not really appropriate, but it's, it's fitting, is we have a toy model of the patient. We have images, we have data frozen in time on which we will make a treatment. And I think it's also important here to realize that when we see images, we see, so the images I show are uh, likewise are, are a thorax, are a chest. Uh, so the, the, the left images, you see the slices, which we call axial of transversal slices, like this. So in the back you see the spine, you see some of the, the shoulder blades, you see some of the ribs, and in the center, the column of our body, you have the heart and all these major veins. And so the other images are different slices. So the image in the middle is you're looking from the side and sh you see the entire lung, and the image to the right is an image from the front, uh, where you see both lungs and this central column that supports our body. And we have, have that. But at the base, these are slices of numbers, 512 by 512 numbers, uh, and about yeah, 200 of these slices, 300 of these slices. And what they are, are just a shade of color, just a value. Nothing in that image says, this pixel, this little point is a heart, this is a lung. 
And that's why it's essential that the system has to be told this is lung, this is heart, this is treatment, this is what we want to treat. And that's that process of contouring, of segmenting. But still, at that time, we are building up this model of the patient. And this model of the patient we have in software. Uh, because we don't only have to find a way of how are we going to deliver this treatment, how are we going to avoid this kidney or the spine, or how are we going to avoid that the lungs get too much damage, because one thing we know for sure is that the radiation does damage. Um, is we need to calculate the dose, and that's, that's the domain of the medical physicist, like a pharmacist that tells the doctor that the pill that she prescribed is 100 milligrams, and I give you the package, and on the package I tell you it's 100 milligrams, and the nursing staff gives this pill to the patient. We have to ensure that what the doctor is seeing, that this treatment, that this gray and this location, that is actually really accurate, and when we will deliver that to the patient, when the nursing staff will deliver that treatment, that this is as close as we can get to reality. So in some way, a medical physicist is a kind of radiation pharmacist. Now, the term radiation pharmacist of a nuclear pharmacist exists. It's not the same thing. But it's, it's kind of what we are doing. And I, I really like the images that, that were shown about the little statue because when I started treatment planning, a lot of the treatment plannings I made myself, and we're talking 20 years ago, were really like sculpture. You start with a rough idea of how you want to treat, and then you start removing parts and you start adjusting and, uh, and uh, until you get closer and closer and closer to the dose distribution that corresponds to what the radiation oncologist will accept, which what, what will correspond to a more or less abstract prescription. Nowadays, Machines have become more complex. There are hundreds of moving parts during a treatment. The parts themselves can move during the treatment. In that, those days, this was still quite rare, or th this was this transition from so-called conformal radiotherapy, where you were shaping, but statically from di different angles, to continuously moving treatments, either by the shape that's changing, or the machine that's rotating around the patient, or both. Um, but once we got that, to that stage where the machine itself was controlled, where you have computers com moving everything, it was no longer possible to do this manually. You could no longer start from a rough block and chisel the, s the sculpture, the dosimetry yourself. You had to find ways to tell the system what you want. So the, 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 the craft, the mastery of treatment planning shifted from doing it directly to creating systems that give you the results that you want, to steering things. Now, the difference between my generative art practice and radiotherapy, my job there is, in generative art practice, I create my own systems that I instruct. In radiotherapy, I'm a user of systems. And, but still, uh, the craft and the art is there in getting the machine to do what you want. Once we have something like that, th this so-called treatment plan, if, you, if we boil, boil it down to its essentials, what it's doing is it's telling the machine how to move in time and what to do, um, how long it has to stay at a certain angle, how strong the radiation has to be, uh, what shape it has to take. So in the end, a treatment plan is a choreography meant for this machine, meant for that patient centered around this one point, the isocenter, which is the point where the patient is. And that instruction set is sent to the machine, which by now is, is quite familiar to you. This is sped up quite a lot. But a treatment then is, is technically the machine doing its little dance every time. And it's very important that the patient is positioned in the correct way, that they are, that they are comfortable, and so, so it's really a caring process. So in that sense, in brainstorming, we, in that did, did have, we have these motions, we have these curves in space. How we can we represent them? Several options. Of course, when I use the metaphor of choreography, it doesn't have to be a Metaphor, it can be a choreography. I fully support that idea. 
It can also be sounds. I mean, it's colors in space. Uh, the sound of the machine itself, as I said in the exhibition, is not that appealing. Um, I wasn't that aware of it. Of course, it's not true that we don't know exactly how the machine sounds. We are outside of the bunker when it works. Uh, so you hear a bit of it, but it's, it's not a very pleasant sound. It's a very electronic, buzzy, annoying sound, which if you would have it in your house, you would immediately look for the electrical device that was broken. Um, I also didn't want to limit it to a digital presentation of, uh, of this data. And I now, in front of me, I see an, an owl staring at me, and that's completely <laughs> accidental. <laughs> but, <laughs> Uh, I just realized. Um, because this is, is, this is a very nice representation of the data of what's going on. Uh, digital has great advantages that we can animate, we can do it in real time. Okay, these are static images, but in the exhibition, uh, they're actually moving. But this does not really capture what I wanted to, to highlight. What I wanted to try was if we have this this bridge between these two care processes where the patient is involved, this, this initial discussion and then the actual treatment, we have this bridge where, where, where we only have the toy model of the patient, but where still somewhere in there, there is a, a very human aspect. And I chose to use a drawing machine. First of all, I like the parallel of doing something as a treatment of a patient where the treatment itself is being delegated to a machine and the parallel with creating art where you do some of the craft, some of the manual labor that you actually give it to a machine. But there is a very personal reason why I, I thought about this drawing machine and that has to do with my father. Ten years ago, my, my father died very suddenly. So at one moment, we had our father to talk with and to have discussions and to argue with, and then an hour later, that was no longer possible. And that lingers, that, that leaves something. And a few years after, I was rummaging around in my childhood, childhood room, and I found in the closet a, a yellowed scroll, uh, <laughs> a, a piece of tracing paper rolled up and it, on it it was a technical drawing of my father that he made when he was graduating as an engineer in, in the 60s and actually in 60 not the 60s in 60 itself now this drawing itself is is my uh, my family actually collected the drawing and framed it and gave it to me and so it's now in my living room and this resonated for me why because at the time i was uh, making work and I noticed the sound is on, so this will be quite scratchy. I wasn't expecting there to be sound. I was making geometrical, mathematical, generative art meant for a drawing machine using technical pens. Um, ah, voila. Using, t using technical pens because these are very precise and, and a part of this work was, uh, was about complex structures arising again from simple sets of instructions. And the reason I use these pens is because they are very, very precise. These are not technical drawings, but these kind of pens give you the same kind of line, whatever you do with them. And then you let them lie around for a week and you spend three days getting working again. But okay, that's a problem every architect and engineer knows about. Nowadays, this has been completely displaced and is no longer necessary. And as a part, I think now afterwards as a kind of a coping process, I created a series of works of something generatively which was ultimately broken, these kind of uh, crystal structures which are generally created to represent something that was broken, something that is lost, which are meant to be drawn on tracing paper with these kind of technical pens. And you get these very clean, nice drawings. And the reason people made technical drawings on tracing paper is because of a process called blueprints. Because once somebody manually drafted such a drawing, you could have a uh, photography process which converted these into blueprints, these blue pr uh, images with white lines and uh, later on inverted, which you could make endless copies of this very hard work that was done. And actually blueprinting is a very old form of photography. Photography is silver-based, blueprints are iron-based. 
and uh, it's something you can do at home. You can do cyanographies because that's what it does, cyanotypes at home. So uh, I bought the chemicals, I made the photosensitive paper, and I made blueprints of these very technical, precise drawings. Now, of course, I made those manually. They are put in the sun, there is wind, so there's movement. And in the end, you got these. And I very much like these. And for me, these, this, this process, although a machine was involved, you get something which in the end is, is organic has been overused, but, but it's, it's definitely some, there's a human element in it. So that's why for this project, I immediately thought about the plotter, but of course for me, it's not a drawing machine. It has this very personal element for me. So the idea then was, we have these instructions that trace these curves in space of how things move. Can we project them in some way to paper? And, and the answer is yes, uh, of course. It, and, and can I send them to the drawing machine? Of course, the, the context is different. In the, the previous iterations, I, I really wanted to reproduce this drafting process, this very precise drawings. While here, I wanted to escape the toy model, the, the fact that, that every curve is perfect. In reality, that's not the case compared to the eyes of center, compared to the patient. So what I explore is, can I use this uh, technical drawing device with something else, like pen and uh, like brush and ink, which introduces uh, materiality to in, into the system in the sense that I have the instructions I give to the machine, but I do not control how the paper will warp because there is a slight excess of ink and this paper becomes wet and the paper starts to bend. This has an effect on the next line and you get small pools of ink collecting. Um, and also depending on how the brush is loaded, what kind of brush you take, there was a lot of research which, which was done over several periods, over months, where the initial idea of I want to get as fine a line as possible. So you, you lose a li little small brush, but a little small brush draws a small line, but cannot tr draw a circle. It cannot hold ink. If you have a brush that holds a lot of ink, you, it becomes very sensitive on how it hits the paper because a technical pen will draw a nice steady line, whether it's the paper is warped or not, you can just drop it on the paper and it will follow the paper. A brush, a brush does not hold itself. A brush has to be held above the paper. That's why writing with a brush is, is very hard. And in fact, the brush I actually use for this work is a writing brush because it it's, it's has the perfect combination of volume of ink to hold, but also of, of fineness of line and sensitivity to... Uh, to how it's set up. And in the end, we come at a process where the initial idea of having a machine making something is turned into, and it's also a term that's overused, especially in generative art, and a kind of collaboration where I continuously interfered. So I was hoping that we could, it takes several hours for the larger ones to draw them. Um, and I always imagine myself to start one of these drawings and then doing something else. And then after two hours and a half, you discover you're still there staring at the thing at the table. And uh, that's also how the idea grew that this pro project can evolve to where the machine is drawing and the interference is being done by the people who are actually affected by what we are showing. And that the results can, the results and now in the exhibitions are. Uh, expressions of what it can be, of how, how it works. But it's not an expression of my personal experience. But this is an element we can definitely infuse together with, with further parts. So, and while this one is running, I do have to thank Ohm who is, has played a huge part in this and has made this possible. I mean, these works would not exist if it was not for the support of Ohm and the fact that you did this entire production.
So Camila, Nicola, everybody from home, thank you very much for this. Yeah. So um, I have a question that I didn't mean that. I mean, it, it was uh, something that was clear in the exhibition because we were there, but you at some point showed also the video of the owl, in the video, the image of an owl, <laughs> that's not an owl, accidental owl. Uh, and you, Yolanda, earlier in your presentation had an image in which you um, clearly, uh, that was clearly depicting uh, the zone that needed to be treated, that needs to be treated. And um, it was clearly one scientific image and uh, some artistic image coming from different type of processes and different machines and different softwares. Uh, but in each of them, uh, color were very, was very present. Uh, in the scientific image, we saw something that looked like um, a heat, like heat, a heat map. Uh, and somehow uh, there is uh, something in the animation that in the exhibition are in the room downstairs and you presented the owl uh, that play with color in a way that, you know, the, the hues go from red, uh, from dark oranges to uh, very cold, bright blues. Uh, so I was wondering uh, what is the connection there, if there is any connection. And um, yeah. The connection between, and, and, and I have to apologize to the scientific community because in radiotherapy we still use this dreadful rainbow uh, colored scale, which is a terrible scale to show uh, quantitative data, by the way. But still, uh, it, it's, it, it's a representation. And what is shown there is the intensity, what, what happens when all these beams cross in the patient. So uh, the representation of the, of the owl, we can't call it now, uh, gives you actually how from different directions, the, the, the more movement there is at a certain angle, the more opening there is of the beam, so the more intensity there will be from that direction in the patient. So the, the connection is that the image you saw in Yolanda's presentation, the, what we call the dose distribution, is a result of the intensity distributions that are so more or less visible in, in the images I make. Um, those those colors are, are a huge shift. It, it, it's a spectrum, so it, it's yeah. It, 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 they derive from the same kind of rainbow actually. But uh, so they are showing the, the the dose distribution is actually the result of my images. Mm -hmm. It's what what is causing that, and it's what why the ISO center is so important, and that's why we rotate around it because that that's the way that we we spare normal tissues by hitting the disease from every side, but all the critical organs only from a few sides. So we are spreading out the damage. Um, my other question would be a bit more for you. Um, and it's about, um, it is about this, this I mean, um, the first time I came to the hospital, um, it was, um, it was quite impressive in the sense that um, it feels like getting into a space that is a place that is uh, something else. Uh, it's a place where I had no other reason to be if, uh, of course, not for this project and a place that I would never go. Uh, if not for, you know, as, as Frederick said, if you have business to attend there. Um, but yet the, the, it's uh, up to a certain point, it felt like a sort of regular hospital space, corridors, waiting rooms, chairs. Um, and then at some point it felt something else. It seemed something else. I think it's something that comes out quite strongly from the photographs of, of Philippe. Um, and then you enter and there is a sneak peek into this into the room where this big machine is and 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 you see from and outside of the room you are in the, in the in this other room where all the 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 doctors and the nurses and all the all the team is uh, working on the patient uh, for the patient and it feels it looks and it feels like a lot like what is 
struck me was, uh, I don't know, to which crazy length uh, we go to um, preserve life or to cure or to care or to heal, um, which is, uh, is something I struggled a lot with when I was writing the first little text of the, of the, of the exhibition because it's, uh, you know, we're living in a, a moment in which, a moment in time in which uh, talking about the sanctity of life feels a bit paradoxical, a paradox uh, right now. And yet uh, there are places and spaces in which an immense amount of resources, uh, of every, any type of resources are put to the surface of caring for other human lives. Um, so I wanted to know about your personal experience in that sense, if you don't mind. Ooh, this is a difficult question. <laughs> I was I, I thought you were going to ask me if I had an idea how patients perceived it. Uh, so I'm going to make a small diversion, if I can. Because I was a bit um not completely agreeing with Frederick when he was discussing, because he pointed it very um frightening and uh disturbing for patients and probably in some way it is, and definitely at the first time it definitely is. But I've, I also have patients who just fall asleep. So, I mean, I, I think what we try to do is indeed be there and make the very technical thing not feel too technical. And while giving the, the caring aspects and go beyond the technicity that we handle. How do I feel it? Um, well, I think I, I told in my presentation that the reason why I chose for this discipline is because it's indeed a very strong interaction you have with the patient. Um, and I think, um, well, for a day-to-day -day basis, this is really something you can change the life of a patient. And even if you can't cure them, you bring them symptomatic relief or... And, and sometimes they go to a very difficult process, that's true, but you guide them through that. And that's, that's I think, what, what for me is the essence of the work that we do, is, is that we use a very technical discipline, but to be very close to a patient. And, and, and being there in a transition that is, that, is, that is very, well, frightening for the patient, because getting the diagnosis of cancer is, is disturbing to the maximum of what you can get. And the fact that we do this in a, in a team of many people working together around that patient is for me uh, very important. So if you ask me how I feel, um, I'm probably, well, I've been doing this for quite a while now, so it's for me very difficult to, to go back. When I started radiotherapy, it was less complex still. Huh? I mean, um, I've been in business a bit, uh, a few decades already. So when we started, it was still much more manually. When I told you about blocks, huh? and now we have all these multi-leaves, so it's all generated a distance and we observe it as, a, I mean, the, the, the model is made by, by dosimetrists and the physicists, and then it's translated to the patient. But before we really had this trace with the block, which was made manually, which was made on the basis of a drawing that we made, and then someone made this manually. And every day, this, this, this block, which was shielding part of the beam to the patient, was put into that manually. That was in the beginning when I started radiotherapy. It was a very manual and day-to-day -day technical but manual exercise. So for me, I, I don't know, I find it difficult to answer your question because I, I've evolved with it over the years. So for me, it's a logical thing. Um, yeah, well. Um, okay, I have one last question and is about um, the fact that uh, we live in a society in which uh, illness is still uh, um, almost stigmatized. It's, there's definitely uh, still a societal taboo to talk about um, illness, cancer. Uh, it's 
crawling in the, the day-to-day life of so many people and yet it's not it's something that we are constantly um, and in almost every circumstance uh, circumstances uh, uncomfortable to talk about um, so I was wondering from both your points of view um, from where you stand and what has been your 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 experiences uh, how and if uh, um, uh, uh, some cross-disciplinary project like the one that uh, that that that, that Fanny developed uh, through his artistic practice, um, how can this and if this can help uh, you as medical professionals to um, at least to communicate better or or to be more acknowledged uh, by the broader public or to have a stronger impact uh, or even I don't know whether it is for advocacy purposes or you know for the greater good or something like that First, okay. this is of course a, a very very small initial uh, project but, but I, I think there is there are a very large number of initiatives around cancer awareness. I think we have mm-hmm. breast count, we have the ribbons, we wear uh, several colors during the year. So there's, there's definitely def- uh, several organizations which are working very hard at outreach, at at least as a patient, mm-hmm. that you don't have the feeling that you uh, are alone. And in the experience I have, the unfortunate experiences in, in, in my close family, those were actually more important than, for example, my personal role in it. Uh, the fact that I was involved in the field was not a, a comfort to the family, but the fact that they came into contact with volunteers of, of, uh, of, of organizations like Comopte and Kanker and things like this, this really helps. But it is true that it's still in the context of being a patient. Mm-hmm. Um, for the what I see, and Yolanda, I might be wrong in this, but what I always experienced is that it, there's a lot of self-taboo in cancer, that when, when people get diagnosed, when patients... I often see or think that, that what they want the most is their normal daily life to continue mm-hmm. and to have this as little intrude into their daily life and then what what i often see and what i often wonder is how i would do if i would have the energy of going through one of these treatments and in in the entire uh, yeah very heavy and involved treatments that there are for cancer and still want to do the same thing every day and continue with with, with my life so that's something i i see and 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 I think for some reason, I think it would be healthier to, to give it more of a place and more of an acceptance that there is a certain phase that now is something to deal with and that, for example, my store that I'm running is maybe not the most important part right now. But I actually, I, I'm, I'm, I know, I don't, I don't know how I would deal with it myself, mm-hmm. in all honesty. true because uh, we have the uh, if 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 a patient complains about something or says about something he or she experiences we have the idea to say i understand we don't understand we never understand we're never in their shoes huh? so i i try to avoid that i understand because as long as you don't live it i think you do not understand it what i've over the years have understood from patients is that everyone lives that trajectory completely differently and that we have to try to um i mean if if that shopkeeper wants to keep his or her shop and he can do it well Fine, perfect. I don't think it's an escape. I think for some people it's just very important. And if we can indeed give a treatment that is is as least disrupting as possible, because that's what we try to do by finding this optimal balance between curing and as limited toxicity as possible, Mm -hmm. which we have evolved enormously over the years, I think we do an excellent job. If a patient needs much more time to digest and just 
step back from his or her daily life and, and take the time to, to, to live this in depth. And if this, I, I, I didn't, well, you didn't discuss with me, so I didn't know, but I, I think that the fact of um, indeed having patients being able to interact with that treatment it's it's an it's a great idea. I think it, it um, for some patients this is really I think can be something to take in their hands and and to live the well it's to to somehow well, live it. And I must say that we've well you have not yet been discussing much, but there's there's a colleague in our hospital that is very much into how can art and different ways of art and experiencing or bringing the experience from a patient into a piece of art how can that heal and help the patient of going through that process now she's a hematologist so she has patients that have very long treatment trajectories where you probably can build from week to week in experience and but I think I've never, I've, when I saw your pictures, I didn't think of that, but I, I also didn't know that you were tweaking the pictures. So now I, I've seen on the picture that you do, that you do interact. But it's, no, I think it's a great idea. I think that is definitely something to, uh, to investigate. And if you speak about awareness, I've been uh, representing the European Society for quite a while, and we, we indeed have been trying to find ways in, in raising awareness for radiotherapy, because everybody, if you think about cancer, they think about chemotherapy, you know, they think about immunotherapy, and, and many people probably somehow also think about surgery, but surgery is omnipresent, so it's... it's but radiotherapy is frightening, eh? Radiotherapy is something that is frightening people. It's... it's it's uh, radioactivity, so you, so and and how to make it understandable for a broader public is, I think, definitely something that 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 we have to investigate further. And I think, well, through art, for me, well, I'm I'm a big um, um, proponent of 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 using art in 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 different uh, well situations of making life more agreeable for myself but also I think for for people living some experiences so I, I think that trying to use the, the message of art and making it less frightening in a way is definitely something I mean but but linking again what Friedrich did very nicely in his presentation linking the the scientific part to to the artistic project is definitely something that I think we should or you should investigate further. And I think it will definitely be helpful for patients as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.